John Wayne Peel joins us for an incredible discussion today on Ventriloquism Weekly. Hello everyone, Matt Bailey here. I am glad to be back at the microphone with a fantastic guest for you today. And I have kind of a little secret. I love it when I know almost nothing about our guests. I really do. There's some people you can do a lot of research on and some you just have to have to hear their stories for yourself. And what little background I have on this gentleman comes from briefly meeting him at the Van Haven Convention this year. And he is living proof of the all types of interesting people that can be met at the Van Haven Convention. John Wayne Peel has led an interesting life as a performer and artist. From a cartoonist to a double act, hear the journey that has ultimately brought Peel to ventriloquism. Plus, find out why he's named after the Western film legend. Here now, our interview with John Wayne Peel. John Wayne Peel, welcome to the program. How are you today, sir? I'm doing just fine, Matt. That is wonderful. Well, welcome to Ventriloquism Weekly. I am so excited to have you. Thank you for coming on uh, this week. I uh, I have to tell the listeners, uh, we met at convention this year and uh, you hit it off, and especially you hit it off with my grandparents. So it was uh, it was cool to all of us uh, get to know know each other. And so I'm curious. I didn't get to talk to you a lot. They talked to you more than I did. Uh, how did you get started in ventriloquism? Well, it's really interesting. I was actually interested in, uh, at first in it when I was a kid, and I just didn't think I could afford to buy a dummy. I thought you had to be a lot of money and you know, buy a handicraft one. So I, I did all kinds of other things. I learned to do impressions. And I was a portrait artist since I was a kid, and uh, it, it wasn't enough. I liked performing in front of an audience. So eventually, somewhere in your 50s, I said, let me look on the internet and see what we have. And I found my L. Stevens site uh, with the uh, Thread Project. And that began the building of Victor. And uh, Victor was very important to me, not just because it was my first figure, but because it was based on my late comedy partner, mm. uh, who was a wonderful talent who unfortunately uh, uh, didn't, didn't stay with us very long. So, uh, you know, I, 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 this was a tribute to him and... Uh, and it was reviving the act. I used to joke that uh, a little thing like death is not going to kill our teeth. <laughs> right, right. That's uh, that's a wonderful outlook. So, so what drew you to ventriloquism? What about it uh, made you say, "Okay, I don't do double act anymore. Let, let's try this." Well, because I was an artist, I, I liked the look of, of the figure. I, mean, I, I used to watch Jeff Bergen on TV, but the person that really got me into it. I don't like his humor so much with Paul Winchell with Michael Ed Smith and Peter Gray Mahoney. Mm-hmm. And I never missed that Winchell Mahoney time when I was a kid. And uh, that was what really, really got me interested. And I used to read books on it. And, and uh, I, I even made uh, cardboard puppets and, uh, and sock puppets and did that kind of thing. But I didn't really, you know, didn't really study the uh, using the ventriloquism until much later. Right, and so what were those first shows for you like? What uh, just stepping out by yourself? I'll be honest with you. The very first time I was terrified, I shouldn't have been. It was at one of the conventions, and uh, as soon as I was told, a, a, a good friend of mine who was my life coach named Richard, and he told me you should tell them right away that you know you haven't performed the ventriloquist which ever is the first time, and they applauded me, and they were just so nice that I loosened up and, and I. I, I was much better, and afterwards, I, I got a lot of uh, praise and, and help with things. And I know I wasn't perfect, I was a little lip control, but, but I, had, you know, I had, had broken my, my virgin status, and, and now I was accepted by a group. Mm-hmm. So, uh, it took it from there. That's uh, cool. And I've always, I've always uh, created you know, cartoon characters or, or comic book characters, and that kind of thing, so creating a character was not a hard thing for me. Plus, the fact that I could do all kinds of voices uh, helped me uh, create even more of a character that way. That's awesome. And I want to backtrack a little bit back to this uh, this comedy double act uh, that you that you brought up. Can you tell us a little bit about that, kind of your beginnings in show business with, uh, with that uh, act that you were talking about a few minutes ago? Well, it was interesting. I, I just, 
I started doing stand up in, in, in Boston first in the coffee houses, and uh, then I took a chance and, and went off to New York City hmm. and I uh, went to the old improv, the original improv. And when I was there, uh, there was a gentleman who just got out of the Marine Corps, and he was just very funny. And that, that was big. And uh, he could do also do impressions and mime. And, and there was such a contrast between the two of us that it worked really well. I mean, I would be this bald thin guy, him being this, this short, muscular guy. Mm-hmm. And so I, I played with all kinds of ideas and came up with a, basically an idea of, uh, of you know, like a, of mice and men type of thing where where he, he didn't understand that he really was as strong as he was, and I was kind of a little hard on him, but trying to teach him manners and that kind of thing. <laughs> and that worked very well for us. And then, then we would go into a little routine with characters. But I, I like, uh, yeah, so it, it, it's a really great working, working relationship. Uh, Victor would, would give me all kinds of ideas. He would start doing, uh, you know, he would get bored and he'd start doing pantomime, and I'd say, oh, there's a funny idea I got from that. And then we'd I'd run and type it out on, on, on you know, like one line with a line or seven, and we would go over these bits and go over these bits and rehearse and go on stage uh, just you know, above away, you know, not too far away. It was really interesting. Uh, it, it, uh, tough, tough audiences in New York City, but down in, 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 in Greenwich Village, that was the better place for us, you know. Uh, right. That, that, yeah, that, that just... So... And so it doesn't seem like a logical step when it finally came about, you know. Because that, and, and originally, you know, it's going to be a, a Jerry Mahoney type character. And I said, no, 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 no. I don't want my, my figure to look like everybody else's. Mm-hmm. Or anybody else's, for that matter. Uh, so um, so I said, you know, well, well, what could I do? I said, well, Victor would be perfect. Plus, he's so unique. I mean, here's this, uh, this, this biker character with, with muscles and tattoos. Right. And that being in the process of me making the figure, which had its own little uh, pitfalls at times. Mm-hmm. Which kind of, yeah, mainly the arms, because I kept trying to I sculpt them out of things that were too heavy and I broke a torso, a wooden torso, and I had to start. So when I went to my first convention, I didn't perform my head, I just had a head fish. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. boy. <laughs> yeah. And, Picture, I was embarrassed. <laughs> yeah, I would be too. Yeah, that that's uh, that that's that's unfortunate. But uh, well, hey, it worked out. You got it fixed. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. So now I now I have my, my Victor figure all fixed up, nice, and even give him a refurbish. Uh, I, I, I put uh, more tattoos on him and had fun painting those, and uh, gave him a whole new torso and a lighter body and all. Right now. My question, sitting here thinking, listening to you talk about this double act, is what have you learned? What were you able to carry over from working a two-human double act to a, a event and a, a character? What what uh, lessons uh, kind of transcend? In a single and a double? Is that what you mean? Yeah, from a double to a single, yeah. Which is really, well, we're pretending it's a double. Well, the beautiful thing about it, you know, when you're up by yourself, it's, it's, it's even more more daunting and more frightening. And, uh, uh, you bomb by yourself, you know. Yeah. At least, at least way you have company. <laughs> uh, but also, you can look at the other person and ignore the audience, and they're just background, and they'll enjoy it, and that's fine, you know. Uh, of course, you want them to enjoy it, but if they don't, then well, at least you have fun, and uh, you know, it's it, it's it's a little easier. At least, I, and, and, but also the timing thing off of each other and all that. Now you still have to work with with sometimes not the best audiences with talk for you. Thing or, or say or yell things out loud, and, and that was that was kind of disconcerting. So in those times, we would just kind of like try to ignore them, finish our act, or just say sorry, we can't do this. <laughs> Good night, everybody. <laughs> yeah, and I had no, no, no other choice, but that was it. So uh, and, and and just it was just a great uh, working relationship after uh, I left uh, Victor. Went and uh, I went back to Boston area and met my wife, and uh, she was still in New York, and uh, I, I think in New Jersey. And so I started doing a screenplay, and, and still kept in touch with him, and, and I really wanted to work with him. And we got separated by a bunch of things. We went to uh, in Texas, New Mexico, where he was from originally, mm-hmm. and that's when I heard how he um, that he passed. Oh. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's kind of hard, so yeah. it was really it was really like a family kind of thing because I, I, I my 
whole um, at that point, my my I uh, I just I had gotten out of the Air Force. Uh, uh, my, my my mother was my only parent alive when she passed on, and then my brother had moved away, and my sisters moved away, so I was on my own. Right. And you know, so I went through one thing to the other, and I think it's, it's just a normal thing when when <laughs> at least in in my way of thinking, it's kind of off the wall, but uh, when you're homeless and you have nothing else to do, do comedy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And I got myself back to my feet enough to see, you know, what's in there. That's wonderful. So, uh, That's great. And uh, at what point in all of this, all of this transitional period, did you turn to uh, doing cartoons? Uh, you know what's funny? I, I had been doing portraits from the time I was in the first grade. Hmm. And I did, actually, I, I mean, like, I doodle around with, with simple cartoons and it was it was actually hard for me to do cartoons because I had to simplify and not do so much detail. Yeah. And it took me about a year to get used to that. And, and finally, uh, when I was in high school, I started doing uh, some humorous things, but mostly I did superheroes. And that was what I wanted to do with my life. And uh, another when I went to New York, I was trying to get into Marvel Comics at the same time for doing stand up, which of course was impossible. Right. You take one or the other. <laughs> so uh, yeah, but but I had wonderful experiences in New York. I met all sorts of people. It was great. That's awesome, and there wasn't enough good things to make make it work. Right, right. And the reason I bring it up is because at this past convention, you showed me a drawing that you had done, a cartoon that you had done, that uh, uh, Marianne Taylor had turned into a character for you. Uh, so that th leads me: Do you often uh, just sort of draw and conceptualize them in, in that style, or? Um, well, yeah, I actually did. You know, it's funny. I had, I was doing this humorous thing uh, when I just got out of the Air Force in '72, and it was about you know, a few hippie characters and all. And I had this bare space in one of the one of the pages, and I said, "Well, I can't have a bare space there. Let me just throw something on there quick." And I came up with this little cartoon of a baby with a coonskin cap and and glasses and sneakers and diapers. And uh, everybody said, "Ooh, that little guy! I like him." And they didn't care about all the rest of the work all the time I put into it. So I said, well, I guess he's the guy. So <laughs> I, many years later, this, that, this year actually, uh, I finally uh, gave the drawing to uh, Marion Taylor, described it. She and her daughter Melissa were thrilled to do it. They, uh, would, they thanked me for giving them the character because they had so much fun doing it. So Samson will make his appearance. And that's kind of great. That's wonderful. Uh, that's a positive response to the character. That's great. Yeah, it it was like, it was like from the page to the puppet. It it was it was very cool because you you had just picked him up and you came over and started talking to us and it was it was really cool to see your first uh, few moments with this with this new character who really I guess since you drew him years ago you yeah. lived with for a while. Sure. So well, it's funny because uh, when, when you know I I I, uh, I actually tried to make the puppet myself and and it's funny even though my mother was a seamstress I can't throw a button. So I I was uh, I, I I bought an old uh, a stuffed muppet uh, Ernie and turned it around and I was going to cut it open and and, and make, I had no idea how to do it and I finally gave up on that mm. when uh, a woman decided that instead of with the mouth that she sewed it back up I said no that's not what I wanted at all so I gave up on that one yeah uh, but so it this had this, this character finally had come come to life and now it's all. Do you find that you will uh, that you'll use that method in the future to to create those characters for yourself? That you'll use um, that you'll draw them first and then and then create them, or are there other ways that you like to use when you're creating it, it, a character? It, 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 it works either way. It's like the same thing with my impressions. So sometimes I'll do a face before I do the voice. Oh, cool! Uh, you know, it's really interesting. I, I remember uh, my sister would bang on the bathroom door because I'd be keeping her out because I'd be practicing faces in the mirror. <laughs> you know. <laughs> And there was a man named Frank Dorshin uh, who was on the Ed Sullivan show, and he used to do, you know, he would try to look like the person of the cartoon of the person. Mm -hmm. That was long before there was a Jim Carrey and all that. And I'm sure that he knew who Dorshin was in one of his idols. But, uh, yeah, so uh, it, 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 it sometimes one inspires the other. It, it's the same thing with a song. You get a melody and then you get the word, or you get the words and the melody comes with it. Uh, so it, it, it's a process with any, any of my drawing was the same thing. You never know exactly what parts it does. You just go full force, go with what you got. 
Of course, the the power of the imagination. Now, before we get to the last question, I gotta know, John Wayne Peel. John Wayne, was that intentional? That is my actual name, and it's an interesting story. My father was John E. Peel Jr., and uh, my mother was, what do you think? She was a superstitious Catholic and Italian. (laughs) And uh, um, she, 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 she... he had, I had a child that was that was stillborn, and he was to be named John E. Peel the third. And she just thought it would jinx me; it was bad luck. Mm-hmm. So she compromised with my father and said, "Well, I like John Wayne," so I became John Wayne Peel. And it was not a name that I uh, I, I would uh, tell people about for a long time because I, I, I was a very short kid with a very high voice, and I was already had enough problem with bullies in the neighborhood. I don't, I don't think it would have helped any for me to tell my name after John Wayne, and then he really just said, you know. Yeah. But finally, when I when I did comedy and 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 and, and the ventriloquist, I said, well, you know, it, it's a good calling card. It's a name people don't forget. Mm-hmm. So I went with the whole thing, you know. So. It's wonderful. It's a very interesting story how that uh, that name yeah. and a tribute to your family became something very good for show business. Yes. And so yes. that, that is actually a perfect lead in. I didn't expect it to be, but that is a perfect lead in into the final question I always like to ask my guests, which is, uh, what do you want to see uh, from ventriloquists, uh, this generation of ventriloquists coming up that are learning the art and performing it uh, as we speak? I, I'm not sure what you're asking. You're asking you what I, I, I want. From what, from what's it. missing in, in, in this art? What, what would you like to see? What would you like to see? Uh, uh, in our art, well, I like to see in art, and in, 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 in the dance of the art. Is that what you're asking? Yes, yes, sir. Okay, sure. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I um, I, I just, I, I want to see it have a big. I mean, it's starting to have a comeback, and I really want to see it have a full comeback, so that it's not just a deaf gentleman and a few people that some people remember that fans remember and not much else. You know, mm-hmm. uh, I want that to be to be far more outstanding. Uh, to be as big as, as Jim Henson was with the Muppets kind of thing. Right. Like, and with myself, I, I, I have all kinds of ideas where uh, I want to incorporate animation in my act. And I thought of an idea where I'd have uh, an animated Samson on stage, and I'd talk to him and say, well, why don't you come out here on stage and then have somebody rustle the curtains and out comes the puppet. Mm-hmm. And make the Samson, so that would be just amazing. Oh, and, that would be great. Yes. Well, that is a wonderful idea, and it has been wonderful talking to you, Mr. John Wayne Peel. Thank you so very much for your time today. Well, thank you. It was great, great talking with you. Great talking with you. Thank you again to John Wayne Peel. I really love finding about, out about Vince. I'm not necessarily, I've heard the name, but I'm not necessarily familiar with their work because it just makes me want to dig in and, and take a look at their work when you hear the stories like this. We all have such unique and different stories, and I really love it when everyone can come on here and tell their story, and that's the truth. This program is for everyone. So if you want to come on, just let me know, and I will get to you. If I haven't gotten to you, I will soon. And I met so many cool people at Vent Haven who want to share their story as well. So we're going to just, there's just a plethora of things coming up. And then I'm heading back to New York. And you know that once I'm, when I'm in that city, you know all the cool, unique things that I, that I kind of hunt out there. So that's my job. If you, uh, so if you know of an interview that would be really cool to do, it's my job to hunt them down and see if they want to come on and tell their story. So let me know. You can shoot me an email at ventriloquismweekly at gmail.com. That's my email. It's me. I respond directly. It's in my. I have like a bazillion emails, like everybody else these days. I have a bazillion emails. It's in the list of emails, so that when one pops up, pop. It's just like in the queue with everybody else. So it's it's my email, and you can reach me directly. So ventriloquismweekly at gmail.com. One other piece of information before we sign off. I'm sure you know this already because it has been literally everywhere. It's a Jay Johnson, the two and only. It was filmed at Thalian Hall, uh, and the filming of it was directed by Brian W. Simon, and it's now finally released on demand. I'm so happy for Jay. It finally came out on August 9th. Wide release, most on-demand services have it. Uh, There's some confusion with pay-per-view versus on-demand that Jay has all the information for, so uh, hit him up, take a look at his two and only posts. There's a like page for Jay Johnson, the two and only. But download it. My suggestion is you rent it on-demand, you watch it, and then in December... 
you get the DVD and you buy more than one DVD because they're going to make great gifts. So Jay Johnson, the two and only. And that's it for us this week. A reminder, you can find all you need to know about Ventriloquism Weekly by visiting our website, ventriloquismweekly.com. Reach out by emailing ventriloquismweekly at gmail.com. We just talked about that. And find our group on Facebook by searching Ventriloquism Weekly hyphen podcast for ventriloquists. You can tweet us at Talk for Two, that tweets us directly. Or if you want to tweet about us, just uh, broadcast the episodes on your Twitter. You can use hashtag Talk for Two, hashtag Talk for Two, spell it out, T-A-L-K-F-O-R-2, and everybody will be able to find it. Signing off for now, for Ventriloquism Weekly, I'm Matt Bailey, reminding all you vents out there to keep talking for two.